Education of Harvard University, Boston, Massachusetts, USA. After winning the Technology Transfer Fellowship from Commercial Law Development Program, U.S. Department of Commerce in 2018. Professor Kaumar provided his service to the National Institute of Education and to the Ministry of Education. Also, he served as the chairperson in the Committee for Popularization of Science and a joint general secretary in Sri Lankan Association for Advancement of Science, SLAAS, in the year of 2019. He was a member of the board of directors from 2013 to 2016 and the current CEO of Columbus Health. TTO of Faculty of Science from 2018. Additionally, he is serving as the director of UBL, University of Columbus, since 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor M. N. Kaumar. Over to you, sir. Good morning to all uh, scientists uh, are here. Uh, I'm really honored to be uh, invited as the chair uh, for this session. And uh, I've been part of uh, KDU Research Symposiums uh, for many, many years as a presenter, as a, uh, a reviewer. So this time it's a different role as the chairperson. So what we're going to do is uh, I'll quickly go through some of these guidelines uh, given for presenters. Recording in progress. Uh, you will notify uh, when the time reached 10 minutes, uh, ringing a bell. So you need to really carefully uh, adhere to this uh, first bell, because uh, then uh, the second bell will ring uh, at 12 minutes time. So that's the time allocated for your presentation. Then we'll follow up with uh, three minute uh, question time. So the questions uh, can be asked the audience, uh, and the presenter will explain uh, these questions. So we're going to start the session rather than delaying uh, uh, the whole uh, process. Uh, is there any questions or any clarification uh, required by presenters or any, anyone in the, in the flow? All right, we'll go ahead with the uh, planned agenda. Uh, the first uh, presentation, uh, paper ID 460, uh, evaluation of uh, loading capacity and release efficiency of graphene oxide based nanocomposites loaded with uh, natural bioactive compounds. FAS Pillay. The floor is yours, sir. Good morning to you all. I'm very honored to be here at the Basic and Applied Science Association at 15th International Research Conference, KDU. I am FASS Pillay, BPharm graduate, and currently reading for MPhil at FGS, KDU. So uh, today I am here to present my study titled as Evaluation of Loading Capacity and Releasing Efficiency of Graphene Oxide Based Nanocomposite Loaded with natural bioactive compounds. So I'll, sub, I'll subtitle my research into uh, seven categories, making a uh, introduction and literature review, objectives, methodology, result and discussion, conclusion, and reference and acknowledgement. OK, I'll continue from the content. So I have subtitled my topic, uh, introduction and literature review, objective, methodology, results and discussion, uh, conclusion, reference, and finally acknowledgement. So moving to the topic, nanotechnology is an area which gain much concern in the research field. So when it comes to nano drug delivery, uh, the spotlight has been received for that topic in the process of developing smart drug delivery systems. When you consider the component which is used in uh, nanotechnology for pharmaceutical aspect, graphite is a key element which has been extensively used because of its unique properties. Graphite, sorry, graphene is a monolayer of sp2 hybridized carbon arranged in a hexagonal structure in a honeycomb lattice. It has some unique properties such as high stability, good biocompatibility, and easy surface modification. 
and we can functionalize the graphite, graphene, uh, making it graphene oxide. And graphene oxide is a potent agent used in drug delivery. It also has some significant properties, including higher surface functionality, antibacterial efficiency, high retention time, and ability to act as a safe duct carrier. So that is a one part of my introduction. On the other hand, I would like to introduce you three bioactive compounds named as vanillin, gallic acid, and cosetin, which, which uh, extensively studied for numerous bioprocess applications in science and technology, including antibacterial activity, anti-inflammatory activity, antioxidant activity, anti-neoplastic activity, and etc. And my research area here I discuss is that, so when you consider that uh, bioactive compound and the nanographene oxide, the incorporation of this bioactive compound to nanographene oxide, please mark the word nano, nanographene oxide has not been studied. And its releasing characteristics are not actually extensively studied. Therefore, I, I aim my research to evaluate the loading efficiency, loading capacity of vanillin, gallic acid, and quercetin, and determine its release in characteristic after it gets loaded to graphene oxide compound, and identify the most suitable bioactive compound for the process of developing a pharmaceutical dosage form. So moving to the methodology, which is a, a critical part of the presentation. So I have categorized the methodology into five parts, starting from preparation of graphene oxide. So here, the method I use is modified Hummers method, according to Jayavardhana VCP et al. 2018. So why, why modified Hummers method? Why not the normal Hummers method? Because if we use the normal Hummers method, it produces some toxic component. And by using the modified version of that, it gain, the product gain more hydrophilicity and more stability and more biocompatibility. Hence, the uh, modified Hummers method is preferred to uh, produce uh, graphene oxide. Initially, uh, pure graphene graphite is collected and then it was oxidized using uh, sulfuric acid and uh, phosphoric acid. Then it is reacted with uh, potassium permanganate and allow it to, for the sufficient time to be reacted. And then we reacted again with uh, H2O2 and then purified, uh, washed, purified and dried. So we obtained the uh, graphene oxide product. Then to make it into nano level, we ultrasonicated the product and make nano graphene oxide. And we took that graphene oxide a bit more further, making it a pegylated graphene oxide. Why, why pegylated? Right. Pegylated graphene oxide has some specific qualities, which is better than graphene oxide. When considered in the drug loading and releasing, always researchers prefer to use pegylated version of graphene oxide because it facilitates this process. And when it consider bioavailability, uh, sorry, biocompatibility and uh, solubility, graphene, uh, uh, this uh, pegylated graphene oxide is more preferred to be used. So we did it using uh, polyethylene glycol and DCC, and finally we filtered and purified the compound to, uh, to reach pegylated version. And now the interesting part. So now I have nano pegylated graphene oxide so I'm going to incorporate my this bioactive compound, which I have introduced you previously, three bioactive compounds, into this nano component in different ratios. And the amount of loading is determined by UV absorption, uh, measuring the UV absorption, and we calculate the uh, encapsulation efficiency and loading capacity. So encapsulation efficiency refers to the amount of drug which is loaded to the nano composite out of the drug we use, percentage, and uh, the loading capacity refers to the amount of drug loaded to the final volume of nanocomposite, the end product. Then we studied the releasing characteristic. For it, we used um, this diagram, it will appear there. And uh, so yeah, there was a uh, semi-permeable membrane, uh, and we used phosphate buffer, and it 
slowly released to the uh, releasing medium, and it was continuously stirred, uh, gently stirred for the homogeneous mixture. I have included this slide specifically because after I submitted my abstract to the conference, it was one of the reviewers' comment. Therefore, I specially include this slide and this chart. I think it is now clear for the uh, audience. Moving to the results and discussion. In this process, I have developed two products, one graphene oxide and pegylated graphene oxide. So those products have been confirmed by uh, Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology for its own characteristic and approved for further study for the continuation of uh, further steps. So these are two pictures for your reference. And in the methodology I have described you, I incorporated the bioactive compound to the nanocomposite in different ratios. So this chart shows you the most efficient ratios which obtain higher encapsulation efficiency. You can see uh, the leading, uh, the highest encapsulation efficiency was shot with cosatine uh, with a loading capacity of 37.79 and uh, vanillin and gallic acid showed comparatively less, less uh, efficiency in drug loading but compared to vanillin, compared to gallic acid, vanillin is a bit higher. And what governs this property? What is the reason for these different ratios? It can be due to the, according to discussion, it can, be, it can be due to the different intermolecular interaction, different physiochemical nature, and internal forces amid the molecule which results this uh, results. And similar kind of results have been obs observed previously with one-to-one -one ratio of nanographene oxide to cephalaxine. And when it comes to releasing, uh, cosatine was the leading releasing agent with initial rapid release within first six, first six hours, followed by uh, gradual release when in second uh, in uh, afterwards. And uh, vanillin and gallic acid were less uh, efficient in releasing, but overall, but overall, uh, all these three compounds achieved almost 95% of releasing within 72 hours, which is an interesting result. So this slide shows the uh, facts that I described. And according to literature, similar type of releasing was observed previously with vancomycin with 12 hours of rapid release. And this prolonged release of this compound is a significant quality because it can be used for the development process of developing extended release product. So moving to the conclusion, uh, pegylated nanographene oxide can be efficiently loaded with vanillin, gallic acid, and cosatine. Among them, the leading agent is uh, cosatine with higher efficiency, and vanillin and gallic acid is comparatively low in efficiency, and it is recommended to enhance the loading efficiency of vanillin and gallic acid in the process of developing uh, good sound pharmaceutical dosage form. So these are my references. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the KDU grant and Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology and KDU KR for the support. And I'm going to relate my topic to the conference theme. It will appear in the slide. Uh, so this product, this nano product, is a, is, a is a one with advanced science and technology, which can be commer used commercially developed uh, which can be commercially developed to make uh, uh, economic usage. Therefore, this product agrees with the conference team, making it uh, economic revival, natural security, and uh, sustainable through advanced science of what? Advanced science of nanotechnology. So hope this uh, presentation make you interested. So thank you very much for your kind listening. Hope you uh, go have good idea on that. How long these uh, nano composites gonna stay in the body when you when you introduce yeah. them to the body? Because the delivery is going to happen after 60 or 70 hours time. So then it will flush by the body within that time period. Then then the drug will be not delivered. Uh, 
So it's going to be a waste. Yes, sir, that's right. You are talking about the bioavailability. So it has to be studied with some animal specimens as well. So this is an initiation step of our study uh, to evaluate the how efficient which, uh, uh, we can load the compound. And surely we will study that, sir, when it comes to uh, uh, clinical studies and determine the rate. But nevertheless, uh, the releasing pattern has been observed in the, this uh, basic uh, step. So it, it proves it is good for a prolonged release product. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, yeah. we studied uh, seven different ratios with uh, uh, pegylated nanographene oxide to bioactive compound, and among them, these are the highest results we obtained. That's why I include just the results in this slide. But we extensively studied different ratios and obtained these values. Sir. And then you prepared using the modified Hamas method. Actually, I think it's improved Hamas method. It should be. Um, so my first one is: uh, you said you prepared nano graphene oxide, then uh, you uh, prepared pegylated graphene oxide, and then uh, you. How can you confirm that it's still in the nano structures? Just my curiosity. I'm asking. Even after converted to pegylated graphene oxide, the structure is still in the nano range. Yes, madam. Actually, we did it in the Slintech. Yeah, so uh, that's my next question. Like, uh, I, I think it would be better if you can have any evidence to show, like, STM or anything like that do you have? Yeah, at the moment I don't have that, but okay. uh, so, so how, that, how did you confirm that's my question? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, the production of pegylated graphene oxide is a collaborative effect with the uh, researchers who work there, uh, because my supervisor uh, really uh, have a, uh, affiliation there. Therefore, we product, uh, produce the uh, compound there and confirm for its... Uh, own characteristic by uh, evaluating its properties. That's how we proved that this product is in the nano level. So like you characterize it even after pegylation? Yes, yeah. madam. Yeah, okay. that's right. So just one more if I can. So I am curious why you selected these three. Yeah, basically. Why that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, so I have extensively studied uh, literature for selecting this compound. We actually shortlisted the product. And the main reason which tend to use uh, these three components is that uh, uh, among the bioactive compound used with nano uh, composite, these three are one of the leading uh, composite. And there were some enough literature and enough methodology way of uh, handling these compound with uh, nano uh, scale and uh, especially with nanographene oxide. So they are, they are for, they are, that's the reason, uh, basically, I selected these three compounds for the study. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, we are moving to the next presentation, uh, paper ID 461, comparative study of hexavalent or chromium, removal efficiency of natural absorbents, Planktonic bacillus uh, subacutus uh, KCB07C10 and their biofilm by ANKCB Akanai. Good morning, everyone. I am Kasun Akanaika from uh, University of Kalania. I am today. I am presenting about my uh, research on on my uh, MPhil research, it's a part of my research, the comparative study of hexavalent chromium uh, removal efficiency comparison between an, a selected natural adsorbent and uh, a planktonic bacillus subtilis uh, strain and their biofilm. So uh, before starting my uh, presentation, I would like to have a brief introduction about hexavalent chromium. Right. 
So uh, this hexavalent chromium is considered as one of the most stable form of chromium. That you know chromium is a element in the D block in the periodic table. And this is applied in uh, various in industries like uh, electroplating and the pigment production and also in stainless steel productions. And also this is considered as a one of the key, one of the uh, essential micronutrient for animals as well as for human. But unfortunately, the higher concentration exposures definitely it can cause hazardous effects on biota, including human, animal, plants, and also on microorganisms. So if you pay attention for the uh, animals, it can cause diarrhea, eye and skin irritations, and kidney dysfunctions, and also ultimately it can lead to the uh, carcinogenic effects, especially in lungs. Therefore, there's a re regulation. Uh, it is highly essential to remediate this uh, hexavalent chromium if it is present in the uh, waste form of an industry. So this is done by under three methods. Physical methods, chemical methods, and biological methods. So the physical methods, we can use adsorption and filtration. For the chemical, we, uh, we can uh, complete that uh, using a reduction or precipitation as well as an ion exchange. In biological methods, we use biological agents. So what are these biological agents? Basically bacteria, algae, cyanobacteria, plants, and fungi. So in my research, so I have compared these uh, two of the remediation processes, which uh, physical remediation and a biological remediation. For the physical remediation, I have selected adsorption in straw or hay, and for the biological remediation, I selected bacillus subtilis KCB07 C10 strain with their uh, biofilms. So in, in my methodology, initially what I have done is I have selected this particular strain and the uh, adsorbent. So I form their biofilm after that. Following that, uh, we perform hexavalent chromium removal test, and finally we compare our results. So if you pay attention for this particular strain, Bacillus subtilis KCB07 C10. So this is a previously isolated from a textile effluent in Gampaha district, Google. And uh, we have purified and we deposited this culture in our uh, department of microbiology in the University of Kalania. And also we have uh, deposited our sequences, gene sequence in NCBI gene bank. Further investigations on, to, on this particular strain, we found out uh, this particular strain can uh, tolerate hexavalent chromium. And also they have a potential of removing hexavalent chromium. And uh, according to their toxi uh, toxicological profile, it says it can uh, tolerate up to 16 milligram per liters, but please keep remember this 16 milligram per liter is the highest con uh, hexavalent concentration that we have applied. Even that, we believe this can uh, increase the co uh, toxicity concentration. And also we have used a low metal binding media. And further, this particular strain indicates some biofilm forming uh, potentials. So uh, considering the biofilm formation of uh, this particular strain, uh, why, I will ask one question, wh why the biofilm is producing? Basically the bio biofilms are produced as a protecting shield if they uh, face uh, some sort of uh, toxicity effects. So for this one, they produce a, a strongly adherent biofilms according to the qualitative and quantitative analysis uh, against this hexavalent chromium toxicity. And I told you that we currently studied using K as their natural adsorbent as well as natural uh, adherent matrix. You know, the biofilms require so, some sort of adherent matrices. So in this, in here I have shown you the uh, SCM image. So this particular corner, you can uh, view the biofilm and in here, the magnification of the bio, uh, magnification of the single cells. For the biofilm formation, uh, practice, what we have done is we have inoculated our culture into this minimal modified medium with straw, and then after that we incubated this particular uh, sample at 30 centigrade room temperature for uh, 48 hours. After 48 hours, we can obtain biofilm. That's how I have uh, uh, got this uh, particular SE images after 48 hours. And for the chromium removal test, what we have done is we have inoculated hexavalent chromium 16 milligram per liters for each of the bacterial culture 
biofilm culture and the uh, natural adsorbent or straw culture. And then within every 24 hours, we have taken out a uh, portion of samples from this, uh, from the, to the uh, centrifuge tubes from flask and then centrifuge it. And we collected their supernatant. After that, we collected, uh, we have followed DPC addition method to detect uh, whether the chromium 6 plus is present or absence. So we measured at 540 nanometers. I will explain you briefly what is this DPC. The DPC is abbreviation for 1,5-diphenyl carboxylic method. And this is a chromium 6 plus quantification method and a colorimetric method. As you can see here, in the presence of uh, hexavalent chromium, it gives this sort of uh, red-violet coloration. In the absence, you are unable to uh, observe any sort of color development. So even the trace amounts can be uh, ob uh, observed from this method. And for coming to the uh, results comparison, what I observed in here, uh, you can see in the blue line, that is the straw or the natural adsorbent. You can see here, up to after uh, 72 hours, it reached its maximum adsorption of uh, si nearly 60 milligram of 60 percent of uh, in, uh, what we have used chromium. But after 96 hours, what has happened? It has gradually decreased. The reason is it started to desorb this early adsorbed chromium to back to the medium. That's a so some sort of problem. Right after the uh, inoculation of bacillus sativus strain, you can see a gradually increasing of uh, adsorption and after 96 hours, it indicates a complete removal according to the colorimetric method. And for the biofilm in red color, you can see uh, within 48 hours, you can reach the maximum or the complete removal. And I have tabulated these results also uh, according to the 72 hours of uh, inoculation. Uh, in here, straw reached its uh, maximum uh, maximum for the I mean for the 72 hours, 51.47 from this uh, inoculated chromium 16 milligram per liters, and for the bacillus subtly strain and followed by the biofilm reached its maximum of 100 percent removal. So, if you pay attention for the removal strategies. For the adsorption, yes, we can uh, we can believe that it, uh, this adsorption process is uh, this straw uh, use uh, adsorption for the removal technology. For the for the bacillus subtilis, it, it was confirmed for the bioreduction, and for the biofilm, it's uh, the uh, combination of adsorption and bioreduction. So, for the statistical analysis, we have uh, used three samples from triple. Uh, triplicates uh, from each, from adsorbent, planktonic cells, and their biofilms. And we analyze these results from non-parametric one-way ana uh, one uh, ANOVA, which is called Kruskal Wells test. We made two hypotheses. Null hypothesis was there was no significant difference of removal between these three of straw, planktonic cells, and their biofilms. And the alternative was there is a significant difference. So according to the interference, you can see the significance is 0. 0 to 2, which is less than 0 0.05, that means our null hypothesis was rejected, which means there is a significant differences. So coming to the conclusion, we can conclude that hexavalent chromium removal can be uh, obtained by all these three methods, straw or either planktonic cells or a bi its biofilm. But for the, effect, uh, for the efficient, efficient removal, it can be performed by bacillus subtilis biofilm on straw. So, but we, oh, our goal is recommended some sort of things to the industry. So, in industries, we can recommend that biofilm, uh, that a particular biofilm of this strain can use for industries who discharge hexavalent chromium uh, to the environment, especially for aquatic systems. So, this comes to the, uh, uh, these are my uh, references. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. I. V. N. Ratnayaka and Dr. M. P. Diyamulla in University of Kalnia as well as for my department. And for the financial grants, I would like to uh, uh, thank for the National Research Council of Sri Lanka and for this opportunity also. So this comes to the end of my presentation, and I would like to open the session for questions right now. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, the floor is open uh, for questions and uh, clarifications. 
question. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have one question for my curiosity. At last, you said that you recommended this process for the uh, higher capacity for whatever the uh, uh, industry. Yes. So what is the mechanism you are going to use in that? I mean, in the industry, you need to do it in a higher capacity. Yes. And if you have any idea about how we are going to do it, and uh, the second, uh, another small question, where yes. are the naturally we found this bacteria? Sorry, sir. Naturally, this bacteria, bacillus, uh, whatever the strain, where do, you, where do you find in natural, where are they are in naturally? Is it a synthesized uh, one or natural one? Well, for your second question, sir, uh, you can find it because we have uh, identified this particular strain from uh, textile effluent, receiving textile effluent in, uh, in a natural water body. So in that particular uh, scenario, you can find out in natu uh, naturally. And uh, for your second, uh, for your first question, yes, uh, we can apply it. As I told you, it can uh, tolerate up to 16 milligram per uh, liters of hexavalent chromium, so all hexavalent chromium. And we have tested this for the mixed metals also. It has also given the positive results. Uh, yes, there's a question because we have, until we have done for the 16 milligram per uh, liter, so uh, if we believe to use in industries, we have to scale up the, the toxicity level or the, uh, whatever the use in chem uh, chemical level concentrations. Uh, for that, we have to do more studies, but uh, if it is unable to find out uh, or uh, higher than uh, particular uh, concentration, what we have to do is we have to dilute the level because in Sri Lanka, uh, the acceptable level is 0 0.5 milligram per liters in hexavalent chromium. So that's what we have to do, sir. And other than that, uh, we can use the same procedure for uh, any sort of uh, organism who form biofilms. There's another question. Uh, can, can you bring the mic, please? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it's a nice presentation. And uh, I, I have like a couple of questions for you. Uh, so do you know what is the detection limit, uh, that colorimetric method? So I decided to get uh, it. Detection limit of that colorimetric method that you, that you detect the chromium? Uh, well, it I wasn't unable to find out the exact uh, level, but uh -huh. in, during my research, what I have done is I have used the least concentration of 0 0.01 milligram per liters, okay. and it gives the coloration. Mm -hmm. It means even in the lower concentration, we can uh, use this uh, particular uh, DPC method, sir. Okay, and, uh, and I have another question. Yes. Uh, yes. So in your last table, you mentioned that, uh, uh, so with the just, uh, just with the strain, uh, you said uh, only the bioreduction can be happen. Yes. So that means no ad adsorption? Uh, well, sir, it, fo it may have uh, followed the adsorption, but after that, it sh uh, definitely it goes for a bioreduction. After it adsorbs to their EPS or the extracellular cellulose, what they do is uh, they do a, uh, a reduction process. Hexavalent mm -hmm. chromium is reduced into the uh, trivalent chromium. Th that's happened after the adsorption, no? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. You appear to have used some statistics. What was your sample size per group? Per group, I use uh, three samples. Uh, per group, three samples. Uh, triplicates, I mean, uh, yes. Did you generate those samples independently from each other, or you just uh, take uh, three no, samples? No, 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 sir. Separately, we have done the triplicates. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we have performed this uh, not only once. For this one, uh, for this uh, presentation, I have used once, even the uh, two times. Yeah. Do in you two think different uh, time scenarios, sir? Yeah. Do you think that uh, the sample size three is adequate for this kind of uh, statistical analysis? Oh, uh, well, in the, uh, I believe that's a problem. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Question at the back. Yes. Yeah. I have a small question. Yes, ma'am. Actually, in the biofilm, you know, the anaerobic condition is creating no inner moss layers uh, in no a biofilm. We haven't detected any uh, anaerobic condition. We only use for the aerobic conditions. Yeah, actually, in biofilm, yes, is the inner moss layers are mostly anaerobic. Yes. Outer moss layers are aerobic. Yes. So is this process actually chromium reduction no here happening? So it is a, uh, in the presence of actually, I just want to know the pla planktonic versus biofilm efficiency of the microorganism because planktonic cells may more efficiently re reduce the 
chromium with that yes. chromium. Because otherwise anaerobic oxidation should be happen in the presence of other compound, maybe in the wastewater, suppose in other compound should be oxidized. Okay. So did you have uh, done some uh, mm. uh, experiment like how the biofilm uh, efficiently reduction reduced chromium over planktonic cells? Uh, we have compared it between the planktonic and biofilm. Yes. Yes. So we found out is uh, biofilm is more efficient uh, than their planktonics. But there is a doubt, ma'am, because uh, in many research you can find out uh, there are different uh, results. It depends on the strain, I guess, ma'am. You are supporting additional carbon sources? Uh, no, we have used trist minimal medium, which has the 0 0.2 uh, of carbon sources. The reason behind that is, if we use high carbon sources, it can in, uh, this particular uh, metal can interfere with carbon source. Therefore, use is the use the least amount of uh, carbon sources in our medium. Is this a pathogenic strain or no? No, that is not a pathogenic strain. You have tested. Yes, no? there is no pathogenic for this. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, if it is a path pathogenic, we, we are unable to use in industries. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your question. All right. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the questions. Uh, so, uh, thank you again. Uh, we are done with uh, you, paper sir. ID 461. Now, we'll go to the next presenta presentation, uh, paper ID 591, Preparation and Characterization of Starch Cellulose Biodegradable Polymer Composite for Property Enhancement. Presenter WGAM. Raja Tunga. Good morning all. I'm WGM Raja Tunga from University of Gujarat. I'm here to present uh, my study based on preparation and characterization of starch cellulose biodegradable polymer composites for property enhancement. First, I'm going to give brief introduction. Can you imagine a life without plastics? Let's see. Plastics are petroleum-based synthetic polymers, and they have attractive properties and wide variety of applications, such as packaging, building and construction, household and sport equipments, vehicles, electronics, agriculture-like things. Over 300 million tons of plastics are produced in every year, and they used to create single-use items, such as shopping bags, cups, stores, like things. And uh, therefore, these plastics makes our daily lives uh, convenient in so many ways that it's nearly impossible to imagine a world without them. However, the problem is these plastics are not biodegradable. That means they require long time for the decomposition. So uh, in example here, we can see a plastic water bottle. The estimated decomposition time of a plastic water bottle is 450 years. That means a plastic water bottle takes 450 years for the fully breakdown. And, uh, and uh, therefore, this plastic waste accumulates in the environment and adversely affects the environment and the biodiversity. Let's see how this plastic waste adversely affects the marine environment. 14 million tons of plastic end up in the ocean every year. And uh, this plastic makes 80% of all marine debris come from surface water to deep sea sediment. And this plastic pollution threatens food safety and quality, human health, fostered tourism, and also contributes to the climate change. And uh, the most visible impacts of this plastic pollution are the uh, ingestion, uh, suffocation, and entanglement of marine species. And uh, so this plastic became a huge problem to the environment. Therefore, we have to find a solution for this problem. Uh, let's see about biopolymers. What is a biopolymer? Biopolymer is a polymeric substance occurring in living organism. And they are renewable, biodegradable material. And uh, among these biopolymers, starch is considered as a promising material for the developing sustainable materials uh, because they have some excellent properties such as renewability, biodegradability, 
uh, like property. So uh, when considering the starch, here we can see the structure of the starch. And starch is mainly composed of two homopolymers of D-glucose, linear amylose and branched amylopectin. However, starch-based biopolymers also exhibit some disadvantages, such as strong hydrophilicity, higher water vapor permeability, low free stability, and poor mechanical properties. In order to improve these properties, natural fibers can be incorporated into starch as a suitable reinforcing material. Then the resulting material is known as biopolymer composites. And these natural fibers mostly composed of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And here we can see the structure of the cellulose. And natural fibers contain 50 to 70 percent of cellulose. Now we know plastic is non -bio uh, plastics are non-biodegradable polymers made from petroleum, and uh, this is a huge problem to the environment. In order to get rid of this problem, we can use biopolymer composites instead of these plastic products. The objectives of this projects are the preparation of biopolymers and their composites using starch and cellulose and the characterization of the polymer films uh, by determining the water solubility, water absorption capacity, tensile strength, biodegradability, and also the analyzing the scanning electron microscopy and the uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and also the modification of the biopolymer composites in order to improve the properties. Let's see the synthesis of starch from cassava. The cassava yams were clean and cut into small pieces and they blended with water, filtered and squeezed using a cotton cloth, added more water and squeezed using a cotton cloth again and allowed to settle at room temperature. They decanted the supernatural, dried at 50 Celsius for 24 hours and finally starch is obtained. Here we can see the observations. Uh, we can see in here the raw cassava, pieces of cassava, uh, and the cassava bagasse, uh, sedimented starch, sedimented starch, then wet starch sample, and the dry starch sample. And let's see the preparation of the biodegradable polymer using cassava starch. First, starch, starch is mixed with, was mixed with glycerol, acetic acid, and distilled water. Let's see the preparation of biodegradable polymer using cassava starch. In, in this process, starch was f uh, mixed with glycerol, acetic acid, and distilled water, then heated until the gelatinization takes place, then poured into petri dishes, dried at room temperature, and this is the st obtain starch polymer sample. Let's see the synthesis of cellulose from Panicum Maximum. In here, first, the plant matter was treated with 6% sodium hydroxide, then stirred for three hours at 80 Celsius, kept overnight, filter, then the residue was treated with 6% sodium hydroxide, Stirred for two hours at 80 Celsius, neutralization, first bleaching process, second bleaching process, and this is the obtained cellulose sample. Let's see the preparation of starch cellulose biodegradable polymer composites. Let's see the preparation of starch cellulose biodegradable polymer composites. In this process, starch uh, was mixed with glycerol, acetic acid, and cellulose suspension, then heated until the gelatinization takes place, and poured into petri dishes, dried at room temperature, and this is the obtained starch cellulose biocomposite film. And uh, next, I'm going to discuss about the chemical reaction between starch, glycerol, and cellulose. Uh, starch combined with glycerol by forming an ether linkage and results thermoplastic starch. And this thermoplastic starch combined with cellulose by forming starch cross-linked cellulose network. And let's see the determination of the water absorption capacity. In this process, the initial mass of the polymer was measured. 
Then sample was allowed to so learn in this state water sample. Then final mass was measured. In the determination of the water solubility, the initial weight of the sample was measured. And this, uh, the sample was stirred uh, at 400 RPM in this still water sample for one hour and at room temperature. And final weight was measured. And this process also process uh, for the 80 Celsius temperature also. And then the determination of the dry matter density and the determination of the moisture content. And let's see the determination of the biodegradability. And in biodegradability process, the weight of the polymer film was measured first. Then uh, the, uh, it was allowed to remain under soil for certain days. And in here we can see the starch polymer sample, the biodegradation of the starch polymer sample after 20 days. Then the determination of the tensile strength. Uh, in this process, the polymer samples were cut into dumbbell shape. Then the tensile strength was measured using the tensile tester. And uh, let's move into the results and discussion. And these are the scanning electron microscopic analysis of the polymer sample. And in this uh, image uh, indicate the starch cellulose biocomposite. In, uh, in this image, we can visualize that the fibers are embedded in the uh, surface. Uh, the cellulose fibers are embedded in the uh, thermoplastic starch matrix. And this may possibly due to the strong interaction between the starch and cellulose fibers. And this starch polymer sample, in this image, we can visualize a continuous surface. And in FTIR analysis, in here, uh, these spectra indicate the starch polymer sample, and this indicate the starch cellulose biocomposites. And here we can, in, uh, after the incorporation of the cellulose fibers, uh, the most of the characteristic peaks appeared at the same wave number. Uh, but in here, the peak uh, that correspond to the uh, OH melting of the water molecule shifted to the higher wave number. In here, we can see the FTIR spectra for the uh, citric acid modified starch polymer sample. And here we can s uh, observe a signal in that uh, wave number. And uh, this uh, in, uh, attributed to the uh, carbonyl stretching vibration. And this possibly due to the esterification reaction with starch and citric acid. And uh, let's see the uh, radiation of the tensile strength of the starch polymer sample. In starch polymer sample, when increasing the starch content, the tensile strength increases. And also in starch cellulose biocomposites, when increasing the cellulose percentage, the tensile strength increases. When considering the water absorption capacity, when increasing the starch percentage, the water absorption capacity decreases. In starch cellulose biocomposites, when increasing the cellulose percentage, the water absorption capacity decreases. Uh, let me consider the water solubility in here when considering the starch polymer sample. When increasing the starch percentage, the water solubility decreases. In starch cellulose biocomposites also, when increasing the cellulose percentage, the water solubility decreases. When considering the biodegradability in starch polymer sample, when increasing the starch content, the biodegradability decreases. In in composites, when increasing the cellulose percentage, the biodegradability decreases. And according to the above results, uh, we can say that the starch glycerol ratio phi to one sample possess uh, better properties. So this sample was modified by incorporating cellulose and citric acid. After the incorporation of the cellulose and citric acid, the water solubility of the polymer film uh, decreases and the tensile strength increases. And conclusion, uh, in pure starch polymer film shows high water absorption capacity. When increasing the starch percentage, the water solubility biodegradability decreases and the tensile strength increases. In starch cellulose biocomposites, when increasing the cellulose percentage, the water absorptivity, water solubility biodegradability decreases and the tensile strength increases. And in here, the starch glycerol ratio phi to one sample was modified by the incorporation of the citric acid and cellulose. After that, the water solubility and water absorptivity decreases and the tensile strength increases. 
And these are my references. And uh, finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to my supervisor, Dr. Nalin Jayaratna, and my first supervisor, Professor Chitra Senegaratna, and all the academic and non-academic staff of Faculty of Applied Sciences and Faculty of Technology, Rajarat University of Sri Lanka, and National Research Council for the grants, financial support, and family members. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, the presentation is open for questions. Uh, there's a question here. Can you bring the mic? Okay, thank you for the presentation. I have a small question. Um, just now, uh, this presentation is basically for to check the properties of uh, this starch cellulose polymer. So uh, I just want to ask now, uh, one of your final results showed that uh, the biodegradability is decreasing, but the tensile strength is increasing. So actually, what is the uh, thing that you're focusing on? At the introduction, uh, you focused on the biodegradability. So are you trying to increase the tensile strength? Or that is the purpose, or just the degradability? Uh, no, Madam, first, uh, I prepared a biopolymer sample composite using starch and cellulose, then determine the properties. So when considering the tensile strength, when increasing the starch content, uh, it increased. And uh, the strength of the polymer film increases when increasing the starch percentage and cellulose percentage. The biodegradability decreases uh, when increasing the starch percentage and cellulose percentage. Yeah, maybe I think you can go for an optimum value there by doing the ratios and then get the maximum for the biodegradability as well, because I think that is the main target here, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. For you. Uh, so have you tried with any other plasticizers other than any, uh, any other than glycerol? Uh, there are some other plasticizers, no? Uh, I used only glycerol. So. Okay. All right. Escalated the starch nanoparticles for Encapsulation of uh, Ruga uh, leucoparase leaves extract from anti cancer targeted drug delivery. Presenter ESM Silva. Good morning, all. I am ESM Silva uh, from Rajarat University. Uh, today I am here to present my abstract on acetylated starch nanoparticles for encapsulation of. Fluigia leucopyrus leaves extract for anti-cancer targeted drug delivery. Have we ever know about 18.1 million cases of cancer are diagnosed per year, 9.6 million deaths from cancer per year, and one out of six deaths is due to cancer. So uh, what can we do to reduce these numbers? Let's see. The most effective treatment against cancer is surgery. However, it is alone inadequate due to the microscopic metastasis. Therefore, less invasive method, the chemotherapy is introduced. In chemotherapy, the small drug molecules are distributed throughout the vascular system. So the cytotoxic drug molecules can reach the cancer cells as well as normal cells. To minimize that, targeted therapy is introduced which having two methods, active targeting and passive targeting. The enhanced permeability and retention effect is a passive targeting method. Uh, it is a phenomenon that molecules in the nanometer range can accumulate near tumor cells rather than normal cells due to the leaky vasculature of the endothelial cells of the tumor cells. Okay, let's see what is the targeted drug delivery system. It is a formulation or a device that uh, enables a therapeutic substance to selectively reach its site of action without reaching the non-target cells, organs, or tissues. There are a number of nano drug delivery systems used in uh, targeted drug delivery, like polymeric nanoparticles, liposomes, dendrimers, polymeric micelles, and carbon nanotubes. When drug toilet nanocarriers reach to the target site, there should be a stimulation, like p temperature, pH, or photoirradiation. In anti-cancer targeted drug delivery, pH is most used because uh, cancer cells are more acidic than the normal cells. Uh, as a polymeric nanoparticle, starch nanoparticle 
have uh, much attention due to their relatively easy synthesis uh, and bioavailability. However, the hydrophilicity of starch is a major problem that limits the applications in drug delivery. So, uh, by improving physiochemical properties, we can convert uh, hydrophilic starch into hydrophobic starch. The acetylation is an esterification reaction which introduces an uh, acetate group uh, to the starch molecule and converted it to starch ac acetate, which is hydrophobic. Uh, let's see what is the plant that we use in this study. Fluigia leucopyrus, commonly known as caterpillar. It is a, a, a dry sown shrub uh, and uh, the leaves of this plant are commonly used in uh, treating cancer in indigenous and Ayurvedic medicines in Sri Lanka. Uh, the major active ingredient found in methanol water extract is virginin. You can see the structure of the virginin here. Um, when we come to the objectives of this study, uh, the plant extract obtained from this plant was not used in drug delivery so far. So uh, the main, uh, uh, the main, uh, sorry, the main uh, purpose of this study to develop a drug delivery system based on acetylated starch nanoparticles and incorporate plant extract obtained from the plant and uh, compare the drug loading efficiency, ca loading capacity, release profile, and particle size of acetylated cassava starch nanoparticle with unmodified cassava starch nanoparticles. Let's see uh, how we synthesize starch from cassava. Uh, washed, peeled roots of cassava cut into small pieces, then pulverized with water to obtain a slurry, filtered, and mix the crude with uh, water and filtered again. Uh, the filtrate was allowed to settle at room temperature for 24 hours. Finally, we canted the top liquid and dried the sediment at 40 Celsius for 24 hours. Finally, obtained the dry starch. Uh, in the acetylation, first starch should be dried until get a constant weight. Then it is mixed with acetic anhydride in the presence of acetic acid. Then mixture was heated to 40 Celsius and tra then transferred to an ice bath. Uh, the mixture of sulfuric and acetic acid was added to the cold mixture, heated. Then uh, the final mixture poured into cool distilled water for the quench the reaction. Then uh, the precipitate was uh, filtered and finally determined the percentage acetylation and degree of substitution. The acetylation percentage was 18.95 and degree of substitution was 0 0.57. As you can see in the mechanism, the lone pair on the hydroxy group attack to the carbonyl carbon and form the ester linkage. And finally, when removing the hydrogen group, uh, the starch acetates form. And let's see how we prepare the plant extract. Separated leaves of plant washed uh, and dried under indirect sunlight and grinded into fine powder. Then uh, it is soaked in uh, isopropyl alcohol and kept aside for several days for the extraction. Um, then filtered the mixture to collect the filtrate and evaporated the solvent to concentrate the leaves extract. After preparation of plant extract, it was uh, characterized using TLC and UV visible spectroscopy. As you can see in the TLC plate, uh, the spot of the uh, spot corresponds to the 1.2 centimeter, which is uh, very close to the value of isopropyl alcohol extract. And also in, in the UV spectrum, you can see 270 nanometer and 273 nanometer. The values are very close to the values of virginin. So this values proves the isopropyl alcohol extract, uh, isopropyl alcohol can be used as a 
uh, solvent instead of using methanol. And let's see the drug loading procedure. The polymer and leaves extract dissolved in acetone and distilled water was added drop wisely. Then acetone was removed using a st slowly stirring and homogeneous suspension was obtained. Then it was centrifuged to obtain residue and supernatant. Residue was oven dried at 50 Celsius to obtain drug loaded nanoparticles. The supernatant was measured uh, under UV visible spectroscopy. And finally, loading efficiency and loading capacity was calculated. Let's see the results. Uh, as you can see in these two charts, the drug loading efficiency and loading capacity always higher in acetylated cassava starch nanoparticle than the cassava starch nanoparticle due to the higher hydrogen bonding interactions between uh, acetylated starch nanoparticles and the uh, drug molecules in the plant extract. And when we move to the drug releasing, the drug loaded nanoparticles uh, dispersed in buffer solutions at pH 5.6 and pH 7.4 and stirred the suspension at 200 RPM, 37 Celsius for one hour. Then five milliliter of suspension was centrifuged to uh, centrifuge and supernatant was observed. Uh, the mesh, uh, absorbance mesh, uh, get the absorbance value at 270 nanometer and 273. Then five milliliter of fresh buffer added to the remaining suspension. And then uh, the steps from three to six was repeated for 36 hours. And finally constructed the release profile. The drug releasing results are quite interesting because as for the uh, results obtained from the UV visible spectroscopy, there were no release of drug at the physiological pH, but released the drug at pH 5.6. And also, as you can see in these two release profiles, uh, there is an immediate release of drug at the target site. And also, uh, the release percentage of acetylated starch nanoparticle always lower than at a particular time than the cassava starch nanoparticle due to the higher loading efficiency of uh, acetylated cassava starch nanoparticles. Let's see another important results, the particle size distribution and polydispersity index. Uh, it was determined by using dynamic light scattering. The mean particle diameter of cassava starch nanoparticle was 113.3 nanometers and uh, acetylated cassava starch nanoparticle was 183.8 nanometer. These values are very close to the nanometer range. And also the PDI value less than 0.5 indicates the uniformity. These values are uniform with respect to the particle size. Let's move to the conclusion. The acetylated cassava starch nanoparticle was successfully synthesized using plant extract obtained from caterpillar and starch acetate uh, synthesized from cassava. And the loading efficiency was 54.09 and capacity was 27.76. And the mean particle diameter is in the range of 100 to 200 nanometer, which can respond to the EPR effect. And also, the, there was no release of drug at uh, pH 7.4, but release the drug at pH 5.6, make the acetylated cassava starch nanoparticle is a promising uh, vehicle for targeted drug delivery. I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Suchitra Senaviratna, and co-supervisor, Dr. M. V. Jayaratna, from Rajarat University of Sri Lanka. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for being an attentive audience. All right, I have a quick question now. Uh, how do you really compare the potency of this selected, how effective this uh, drug uh, compared to the other 
known ones like uh, the Paragilavan with this one. Have you have you compare any of these like in the comparison? Uh, no, not sir, yet. Not yet, sir. Uh, have you done whether the plant extract has any effect on the effectiveness of the selected drug? Maybe they have when they are together, they might have different effects. Sorry, sir, I didn't get the question. Yeah, now you have a vehicle to transport your drug. So is there any interaction between vehicle and the drug? Yes, uh, it is a uh, hydrogen bonding interaction. No, uh, not a chemical one, like yeah. in the action inside the body, or is there any, any change in the effectiveness of the drug? Uh, you're asking, sir, at the target site? Yeah, at the target site. Uh, in the target site, uh, the target site is a low pH environment. So in low pH, uh, the drug molecules tend to release from the uh, acetylated starch nanoparticles. Uh, as I uh, remember, uh, right. due to the uh, higher hydrogen, uh, the H plus groups present in the uh, tumor cells. Okay. That will do. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to the next presentation. Paper ID uh, 607. Biodegradable polymer composite using starch-based polymer and thick sawdust. RMRN Ratnayaka. Good morning, all. I'm Ilmi Ratnayaka from Hajar University. I'm here to present in my abstract on biodegradable polymer composites using starch-based polymer and thick sawdust. Nowadays, plastics are created a huge problem to the environment. Since 1950 to 2018, about 6.3 billion tons of plastics have been produced worldwide. 9% and 12% of them have been recycled and incinerated respectively. However, their waste create environmental pollution that seriously affects ecosystems, wild, marine life, and humans. Furthermore, at the end of 20th century, plastics have been produced, plastics have been produced environmental pollution. Thermal treatment is the only way to fully break down conventional polymeric waste, which in return, a lot of waste in the environment. There are so many alternatives that can be used for plastic products. Among them, we selected biodegradable polymer composites. These are, my objective, these are the objective of my research. Extraction of a starch from edible and non-edible sources, chemical modification of a starch and sawdust, Preparation of biodegradable polymer composites and teak sawdust. Characterization of polymer composites by following these characterization, characterization techniques and introducing the biodegradable material. Acetic acid, sawdust, glycerol were added to the polymer composite. The purpose of adding acetic acid, it breaks the branch of amylopectin into straight amylose molecule and resist fungus. This is the image we obtain polymer composite without adding acetic acid. This one with acetic acid. You can see some fungus had, had been grown in, th in this field. So does act as an organic filler. Glycerol acts as a plasticizer it enhances the ductility of a starch, improves the elasticity, reduce the plastic crystallinity of polymer composite. This is the reaction between starch and glycerol. It forms thermoplastic starch at high temperature. Extraction of a starch from cassava and jackfruit seeds. Clean, let's see, extraction of a starch from cassava. Clean cassava was cut into small pieces. They were blended with water until making a slurry. The slurry was filtered and squeezed using a cotton cloth. It was allowed to settle and decanted after one day. Then sedimented starch was dried and collected. Extraction of a starch from 
jackfruit seeds. Clean sun dried jackfruit seeds were soaked in 0.5% of sodium hydroxide. It was washed with distilled water until supermedium was removed. After this step, same procedure was followed I mentioned in extraction of a starch from cassava. Starch we obtained from jackfruit seeds, this one from cassava. So far we used cassava which is an edible source. It cut some parts of food chain. Therefore we found some alternatives such as avocado seeds and mango seeds. Same procedure was followed for extraction of a starch from both avocado seeds and mango seeds. Clean avocado seeds were cut into small pieces. They were blended by adding water until making a slurry. The slurry was filtered and quizzed using a cotton cloth. It was allowed to settle and decanted the upper layer. The rest part was centrifuged and collect the bottom part of the centrifuge tube. It was washed with distilled water and kept to settle. Finally, the star slurry was dried. Starch we obtained from mango seeds and this one from avocado seeds. Chemical modification of sawdust. Unmodified sawdust was soaked in 5% of sodium hydroxide solution at room temperature. It was filtered and washed with distilled water and acetone. Then modified sawdust was dried and sealed. You can see in here the color difference between modified sawdust and unmodified. Sorry, you can see the color difference between unmodified sawdust and modified sawdust. However, you can't see in here, but modified sawdust was low dense and fluffy. There are three types of polymer composites were prepared. Unmodified a starch with unmodified sawdust polymer composite, chemically modified a starch with unmodified sawdust polymer composite, unmodified a starch with chemically modified sawdust polymer composite. Let's see preparation of unmodified a starch with unmodified sawdust polymer composite. Cassava starch was mixed with acetic acid, glycerol, and distilled water. The mixture was stirred at 80 degrees Celsius until gelatinized the mixture. The solution was stirred by adding unmodified sawdust and distilled water. Then the solution was poured into petri dish and it was allowed to dry. Same procedure was followed for preparation of chemical, chemically modified starch with unmodified sawdust polymer composite. But in this step, citric acid was added additionally. In preparation of unmodified starch with chemically modified sawdust polymer composite, in this step, modified sawdust was added. Among these three polymer composites, we selected chemically modified starch with unmodified sawdust polymer composite and unmodified starch with chemically modified sawdust polymer composite for the preparation of biodegradable material. Same procedure was followed in here, but in this step, polymer composite was allowed to 10 days. After 10 days, the polymer composite was uh, molded and it was workable. Results and discussion. Biodegradability test. Biodegradability of polymer composite was decreased with increase in the sawdust percentage and also it decreased with chemical modification of sawdust and chemical modification of starch. This is the image we obtain polymer composite after 10 days of degradation period, this one after 20 days of degradation period and this one after 30 days of degradation period. Water solubility, water solubility decreased with increase in sawdust percentage and also it decreased with chemical modification of sawdust and chemical modification of a starch. Water solubility increased with increase in the temperature. This is the image we obtained water solubility of polymer film at room temperature and this one at 80 degrees Celsius. Water absorption capacity decreased with increase in sawdust percentage and you can see in here starch with 20% of unmodified sawdust has 
lowest water absorption capacity. Moisture content decreased with increase in sodas percentage. Tensile strength also increased with increase in the sodas percentage and you can see in here starch with 60% of chemically modified sodas has highest tensile strength. These are the SCA micrograph of star polymer composite image A 0% of sodas content and image B 20% of sodas content. You can see image A has a smooth surface and it consists some granules that indicates starch particles that are not fully gelatinized. When we come to image B, the topography was changed and it was more rough and frigid. And sodas particles were well dispersed in the starch polymer matrix. Let's see FTIR analysis. Let's see FTIR analysis of polymer composites. In first graph, green green color indicates the unmodified sawdust. This one indicates the chemically modified sawdust. The peak appears in the chemically modified sawdust at 3027 indicates the alkoxide group of chemical modified chemical modified of sawdust. In here. Blue color indicates the starch with unmodified sodas polymer composite and red color indicates the starch with chemically modified sodas polymer composite. You can see in here the peak intensities are different inside the green circle. It is possibly due to the chemical modification of sodas and it is possibly due to the interaction between starch with chemical modification of sodas. Then the comparison between starch with unmodified soda polymer composite and chemically modified starch with unmodified soda polymer composite spectrum. The peak indicates the carbonyl, ca carboxyl and ester carbonyl bond strength, bond strength. And it, that, is that is represent the starch cross-linked with citric acid and form starch, chemical modified starch. When incorporation of uh, sawdust with starch polymer matrix, it enhances tensile strength, water absorption, water solubility, and rate of biodegradation. All the properties are based in starch with chemical modified sawdust polymer composite and chemically modified starch with unmodified sawdust polymer composite than the starch with unmodified sodas polymer composite. Furthermore, properties of composites can be enhanced using modified starch with modified sodas by coating with natural wax or combining with binding agent. There are no more options. We can use these polymer composites by coating with synthetic polymer. These are my references. I would like to, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to my supervisor, Dr. Nalin Jayaratna, my co supervisor, Dr. Suchitra Seneviratna, Faculty of Applied Sciences, Hajarat University of Sri Lanka, Professor Anjit Vidrisinghe, Professor Ajit Therat, and all the academic and non academic staff of the Faculty of Applied Sciences, Hajarat University of Sri Lanka, and uh, finally, National Research Council for the financial support. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, the presentation is open for the discussions. Any question? Yes. Uh, can someone bring a mic? Yes. So thank you for the presentation. So I'm asking this uh, question out of curiosity because uh, previous presenters also talked about this starch and the source was like cassava. And this is all based on application and we are looking for biodegradable uh, polymers producing. So I'll just one question now, let's say if you take one gram, or one kilogram of cassava, what is the output amount that you got as the starch? Uh, Roughly, I'm asking you uh, because you are the last presenter here. Then, uh, 0.25 kilogram. Oh, no. Okay, so that is like, that's my question. So uh, we are looking for an application here and we are taking one kilogram of, let's say, for example, Cassava, the output is really small, so if you are going for a production, I have some uh, 
yeah, concern there. That's the first question. And then out of your three products that you have unmodified cassava with the modified uh, sodas and so on, um, and then out of those three, which is the best you assume here? Because you, in your graphs, for some you had the best, and for the for the other, like for the absorption, it it, it shows low value and so on. So I'm asking yeah. which combination is the best according to your research? According to my research, starchy chemical modified soda composite is the best. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I was thinking because uh, you haven't done, I think yet the two modified versions yet has not been yeah. done. Yeah. So that was my question. Okay. Right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, now, since we uh, took the questions at the end of each presentation, we are not going to allocate a separate time for questions and answers. But if anyone have maybe one or two questions, I might be able to allow to ask and answer. All right, thank you. So it's time for me to give a summary of the session. Now. I will not go through the scientific detail of this research, but I have some key observations. Now, the first observation is uh, some of these projects are mainly based on some unique uh, material or a, a unique uh, chemical coming from Sri Lanka. So if you are using a unique material, always think about the commercialization or bringing this to a commercial level. Now, since you are spending maybe two, three years of your time on your research work, at the end, a dissertation and a publication, yes, you might be expecting those two. But remember, Sri Lanka, at a, a position we need to really look at to bring our research to the commercial level and uh, send this to maybe international market or at least uh, provide some support to the Sri Lankan market. So think how you can commercialize this research work and make them your ideas, your innovations, your scientific finding to the market and bring some money to your university and save some foreign currency to Sri Lanka. The second key observation, when we are using material for product development, always try to use some non-edible or uh, the material that might not be able to use as food. Because if food is used as product development, like non-edible product development, they are going to be a competition. So then the food price will go up and they are going to be a huge problem in the in the future but if you're using a food material like uh, one uh, uh, question asked if you're using food material make sure keep it at least 90 95 percent or 99 percent usage rather than wasting food the last comment is now most of these product development are based on energy and based on uh, fossil fuel to manufacture one gram of your product if you are wasting maybe 10 liters of fuel or all these other resources. We are not really focused on other resources. We are mainly focusing on the material goes to product. So you need to focus on these other resources, time, fuel, energy, etc. So think about these other resources when you're converting something into a product. Scientifically, these are great research projects, but when you are selecting a project, science plus the end usage and how we proceed from that point onward need to be considered. It's a just a, 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 a thought I, I had in my mind when I go through these abstracts. So that's from my side, and I congratulate all the presenters for wonderful work. Hope to see you all maybe at a different conference. And I want to thank KDU for organizing a wonderful conference uh, and allowing these now new scientists to present their work at an extremely high professional atmosphere and physically uh, to some humans because we had a time period, we did everything online, maybe no one know how to do a physical presentation. So I want to thank uh, all the members at Kottalal Defense University for organizing a wonderful uh, conference and thank all the audience to be here and participating with this uh, magnificent session. Thank you so much. We are done with the session and we can move to the next item at the agenda. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. It was truly an in insightful session. And now I would like to take this opportunity to thank the chairperson of the session, uh, Professor M. N. Kaumal, for his contribution, as well as for the panel of the judges for their contribution towards the session, and also the presentation presenters for their efforts made for these presentations. Now, uh, I would like to cordially call upon uh, the Vice Chancellor uh, of, Sir General, Sir, uh, of General Sir John Kotelawa Defense University, Major General Melinda Piris, to award the uh, tokens of appreciation to Professor M. N. Kauma. Thank you, sir. We will now go for a short break, and we will uh, rejoin with the technical session two at 10.30. Refreshments are arranged to you outside. Please join. Thank you. <laughs>